on the internet, on Android devices, on iPhones, whatever they may be. And the only comparison is old Rush Limbaugh at a 13.7 share. I don't do that to denigrate him, but I'm in a very competitive business. And I'm winning. And you got to know I'm winning. And there's a reason you got to know I'm winning. Because my message is resonating with America. My message is resonating with the young Americans. My message is getting out there. So don't think you're alone. You see, the way the radical left works is they want to marginalize you, not only societally, but in your own head. They want you to believe that you're a little crazy. They want you to believe that your own thoughts are out of step with the real America. But you are the real America. They are the criminals who have hijacked the nation. They have stolen the nation right out from under our feet like Houdini. Like out of a hat, they stole it from us. They stole it from us when we're the power. We are the people. We're the workers. We're the taxpayers. Not Black Lives Matter. Not people who burn and loot and shoot police. They're the refuse of society. The rubbish of society burns and loots. But the country is so upside down that they invite the leader of this refuse to teach at Yale University and he gives a lecture on how, why looting is justified and it's a victimless crime. Tell that to the Korean store who got burned, the Korean store got burned down. Tell that to the black lady whose beauty parlor was set on fire. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. At least I can understand Gene Vincent and Little Richard. They say it like it is. The other one gives you a, a speech. Whatever you say to him gives you. Now, Steve, let me put it to you this way. It's not that I'm a failure and everyone's laughing at me behind my back. That's not true. No, Putin's not doing anything uh, that's real over there. It's me who's doing nothing that's doing some, something. Although I've done nothing against ISIS, I'm the one who really did something. And while he's killing ISIS and knocking him off the battlefield, he's doing nothing. That's the way to look at it. The world is upside down, Steve. The world is flat and you keep saying it's round. We all know the Earth is the center of the uh, planetary system, Steve. I don't know how you can say it. We all we know the world is getting colder, not warmer, but you say it's getting warmer, not colder. Or is it I who say it's getting warmer, not colder? I don't know anymore. All I know is that there's trillions of dollars being made by uh, Nancy Pelosi and company on global warming. Why should I say anything different when so much money is flowing into the coffers on the global warming scam? Why, just the other day, Steve, you may say there's global warming, but there are people in the U.N. who are making millions of dollars a year on global warming. So how bad could global warming be, Steve? That's why we're trying to stop it. It's like the American Cancer Society. It's been in business since World War II, and they haven't cured cancer yet. People in the business say they don't want to cure cancer, because the day they find the cure for cancer, they're out of business. Steve, it's the same with global warming. You're killing a very good industry. It's an indigenous, indigenous industry, Steve. You have to understand, you've got to keep your mouth shut, Steve. Even if global warming is a fraud, it's good for business. Take a look at all the beachfront houses that are being built. You think they're being built out of thin air? They're being built with money scammed out of the government through global warming and carbon credits. I mean, the money does get spent. Now, if it was Ronald Reagan saying it's trickle-down economy, fine, you would say it was a good thing. But just because I'm creating it on a scam and it's trickling down from the grifters and the con men and the global warming business doesn't mean it's a bad thing. So, Steve, I say before you show data which shows the global warming is a fraud, understand you're affecting our economy. It's unpatriotic, and frankly, it doesn't matter whether it's true or untrue. What matters is the money is flowing into the pockets of the Democrats and their donors. That's how they keep the lights on on Pacific Heights. That's how they send their children to drug rehab. It's the global warming money. How else can they send all those children to drug rehab? Could they afford to keep sending their kids over and over again to drug rehab on Pacific Heights uh, if they didn't have the global warming scam to line their pockets? Most of them are inheritance cases, Steve. You know they're incompetent boobs. They can't make a real living. It wasn't for government handouts for me because of the fundraisers. Half the lights on Pacific Heights would be put out, Steve. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. I've just gone on a tear. Okay, my producer does. He raised his hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Let's see what else is in the news in the sound log here. Oh! Oh! All right. Get the... Um, we're going to play Nancy Pelosi, Robert, so you know what we have to get ready. The, uh, the clock, the cuckoo clock. Here is Nancy Pelosi, probably the smartest woman in the history of the United States Congress, saying that the reason we have to get rid of the Gitmo detainees and send them back home is because of economic opportunity. I don't know what she means. She doesn't know what she means. But if you listen, maybe you can tell me what she means in clip three. 
uh, the Guantanamo is an issue. It isn't actually completely factually a case. The people in <laughs> Illinois were looking forward to having uh, some people transferred there. They saw it as economic opportunity, as you may recall. The problem with Guantanamo has been the resistance of the Republicans to enable that policy to go forward. God, what a country. It's as though the entire political structure has atherosclerosis, like a rigidity. These people are almost 80 years old. Most of them are senile. You know, when I was working for my Ph.D., my doctorate, which I'm proud of, and those of you who don't like it can go to hell. When I was working for my first class Ph.D. at the University of California at Berkeley, my professor at the time, a very distinguished medical uh, researcher, said, Michael, the first thing to go in the uh, elderly is their judgment. When you listen to Nancy Pelosi, when you listen to the others, like Dianne Feinstein, approaching their eighth decade on the, on the earth, are you telling me that that doctor of mine, that professor, was wrong? Now, I'm going to play this again. Here is Nancy Cuckoo Clock Pelosi saying that the reason to transfer them out of Guantanamo, the terrorists, the generals off the battlefield, is because of economic, uh, economic opportunity in Illinois. Now, I don't know what she means by that. You mean they're going to go to Chicago and create more shooting wars? They're going to create terrorism, which is good for the construction business? They're going to blow up things, which is good for people to rebuild them. What does she mean by economic opportunity? Let's listen again. I can't follow it. Uh, the Guantanamo is an issue. It isn't actually completely factually a case. The people in Illinois were looking forward to having uh, some people transferred there. They saw it as economic opportunity, <laughs> as you may recall. The problem with Guantanamo has been the resistance of the Republicans to enable that policy to go forward. There's nothing more you can say, actually, completely, factually. That's a heck of a use of words. If I were a 7th uh, grade English teacher, I'd put her back in the 4th grade. Uh, I'm saying, Nancy, I'm sorry, you have to go back to the 4th grade. We can't use actually, completely, and factually in three three words in a row unless you're in Congress. Then, then you can do it. See, if you get to the point where you go to the level of a politician, you can do anything you want. You can say actually, completely, factually, and people will think you're a genius. You can say that we should take the dangerous terrorists out of Guantanamo and release them because there's an economic opportunity for people in uh, Illinois. You could say that, too, and people will say, wow, that's a great idea. Where is the economic opportunity in releasing dangerous terrorists into Illinois? Can anyone figure that out? What, they blow up a dam and someone in the construction business gets the uh, uh, request for proposal to rebuild a dam at 50,000 times higher than it costs, like the San Francisco Bay Bridge? I love that one. How do you like the RFP on the San Francisco Bay Bridge? This is not a corrupt city, not a corrupt state, not at all. They rebuild a bridge and it's falling apart before they finish it. The cables are rusting. Anyway, here we are, going for a song. Maybe America could be sold for a dollar. Here's the um, Alabama guitar house, was, guitar, guitar, guitar house that was on the market for $14 million last year is now on sale with starting bids at a dollar. Seven Montego Way in Alabama includes a horse riding arena, 15 bedrooms, 16 bathrooms, a fitness center. The 27 acre probably going to the hammer. It was on the market last year for 14 million. No one bought it, so now it's on the market for a dollar. That's like the United States of America. It's on the market for a dollar. No one's, there's no takers. It has more than uh, 27 acres. Figure out the acreage for America and put it on a uh, on a real estate site like realestate.com. Uh, nation for sale. 1,500,000 bedrooms. 16 million bathrooms, fitness centers, yoga centers, comes with national parks, includes an army, a navy, and an air force that can't get out of its own way, and it's for sale for a dollar. The first bid will be a dollar. Do we have any takers? Even China wouldn't bid on it. Oh, we have someone who has something to say other than me ranting and raving today on the Savage Nation. Even though my rants are good, not everybody appreciates it, you have to understand. Some get, a, some get upset by it. They get upset because the rants are so poignant and so cutting they're not used to it. They want polite men in talk radio. They want men like John Boehner, someone who gets along and goes along. They want someone who gargles his words, someone who looks good with man tan and a nice, a nice Robert Hall suit. Robert Hall this season will show you the reason. Low overhead. It's an old song I used to know. Oh, here's one. Line six, Anna Maria on KSFO. Here's a little topic. Go ahead, Anna Maria. What's on your mind? Hey, Dr. Savage. I'd actually like to compliment you on one of your rants. Uh, my best friend was listening to me. <laughs> and she well, now, how dare you call my genius rants? I'm joking. Go ahead. All right. 
right. Uh, so, you know, she was saying that you were at reacting appropriately, thank God, to uh, the issue of uh, the Afghan pedophilia thing being tolerated as a cultural norm. Oh, you mean the Afghan troops raping boys who were screaming and our brave men went to punch them in the nose to stop the rapes and the punk general said don't stop them from raping, that's their culture, and then they court-martialed a soldier who stopped the Afghani rapist? Is that the oh, story you mean? I have no idea how upset I am about this. I'm actually the person, I was in Afghanistan in 2009, I'm the person who wrote the report for the military explaining the issue of pedophilia in Afghanistan. I wrote the report, Palestinian Sexuality, and I'm the author of the book, Crossing the Wire, One Woman's Journey into the... Wow, history. wait a minute, hold it, you're an important person, I'm not meaning, I don't mean that uh, in any sarcastic manner. So you were there, you were embedded with the troops? That's right, sir. And, and who, were you write, who were you writing for? I was right. I was a. De I was employed by the Department of Defense. I was embedded with the Marine Corps uh, when we were taking Helmand Province in 2009. Okay, and that is w right when. I, and I was a, a, a human terrain. Um, I was employed by the human terrain system. I was the lead social scientist to the, for for the area. Okay, that is right when we were beginning to British troops and our troops were beginning to have trouble with sexual issues with the the Pashtun people we were encountering. So wait, wait, explain to the people. What do you mean Pashtun? Who are they? We hear Pashtun speakers. Are they different than the general Afghani population? Uh, you know, you said such a brilliant thing there because, the, you know, you almost have to say general Afghan population in air quotes. Uh, Afghanistan is the kind of place that's full of so many different people with so many different cultural traditions. And well, isn't it true that Afghanistan is an invention? Wasn't it created by the colonial powers and never existed? It's exactly right. So, so the Pashtun people basically are the people who live in southern Afghanistan and uh, northern Pakistan. They live along the border. That border doesn't exist to them. It's a, it's a meaningless thing. And 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 similarly, Afghan rule of law means very little to them. Unfortunately, we. Well, what is it? The, are you saying these tri Are you saying these tribal throwbacks rape boys as part of their culture? I mean, let's clear the air here. Is that what they do? They rape boys because they can't find women. What's the story? Oh, let me explain that. And first of all, let me just object to the to, to, to the, even the sentiment that this is, you know, something that needs to be respected culturally. What we're talking about is a, I'm all about respecting culture, but what we're talking about... Oh, no, in San Francisco, it has to be respected culturally. You have to ask Nancy Pelosi. She'll tell you that raping boys in Afghanistan is something we should have uh, no business to investigate because it's part of their culture. And it's very imperialistic of us to even stop the rape of boys by men because it's invading their cultural priorities. See, and that's, that's, that's why I'm calling to, to, to object to that, because unfortunately it's using my work to make that argument when my work was actually completely the opposite. Um, okay, yeah, so to answer your original question, they rape boys because, well, first of all, uh, marriage is economically prohibitive. Uh, you have to have a dowry. If you, if you have sex with a woman you're going to, and you're not married to her, you're, you're going to have issues of honor killing and intertribal uh, 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 retaliation. So you can't do that. So you have... Uh, Sounds like Brooklyn. That? Sounds like Brooklyn. It's no different. But uh, anyway, go on, please. Yeah, you know, and, or it's like it's like it's like prison. Maybe you know, men have sex with men, and you know what? That's adult and that's consensual. And I, I really, that's not my issue here. The thing that also I don't know that it's consensual. Yeah. Rape is rape. I mean, I, I wouldn't call a male rape in a jail consensual. A lot of these guys are overpowered, and they have to submit or they die. But that, that's a separate story. In Afghanistan, though, the, I want to remind my listeners what you're talking about. It's very important. It's a very serious story. You actually broke the news of Afghani men raping boys. Our troops were so offended by it, they stopped the rape of the boys, they beat the guys up, and their commanding punk officers called them up on court-martial for interfering with the Afghani way of life. Isn't that some more or less what happened? That is precisely what happened. And let me give you a little more background to that. When, because it, it helps you see this, this very, very, very bizarre switch that has happened in our administration's uh, perspective on this issue of Afghan boy rape. And it is rape. I, I'll go back to that. It's absolutely rape when, when we're talking about the boys. That's a different issue. Now, when my report came out about the fact that this was going on, that, that boys were being raped, and this is part of the world of uh, indoctrination that becomes a security threat to our country, I'd like to talk about that, too. But the immediate reaction by General McChrystal on the ground was to condemn this and to ask our troops to be on the lookout for these young recruits so in order to, to protect them. In other words, the good General McChrystal was smeared by Obama. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. 
So all the good generals were purged out of the military, and all the shills were put in by the girls' choir uh, under Barry Obama, who looks to 